Welcome everyone to our first panel discussion in the Confronting Racial Injustice series. I'm thrilled to be here. When the pandemic began last March, we at Northeastern Law School asked this question, would we be able to gather together during a pandemic, social justice warriors, prosecutors, defense lawyers, stakeholders, racial justice advocates, law professors, students, staff, retired judges and judges to create a community focused on making our criminal justice system fairer and more just. We founded the Northeastern Criminal Justice Task Force to do just that. And we invited anyone with the will and capacity to help to join us. And they did. We now have 130 task force members. One of our very first dreams was to examine the history of Boston through the lens of racial justice. How could we in Boston confront our history and learn from it? Because as Maya Angelou said, if you don't know where you've come from, you don't know where you're going. So we created a subgroup led by Barbara Berenson and Judge Barbara Dorch O'Cara to organize this effort. And our dream was destined to become a reality the day they accepted that challenge. Without funding or any staff, through sheer will, determination, and commitment, they created this series of panels. For those of us who have dreamed this dream, we know that this day would not be possible without their hard work and the amazing subgroup they nurtured and led. Never doubt the power of the two Barbaras. This series is meant to help us confront some of the darker sides of Boston's history, the stories of injustice and inequality. We begin at the beginning with a focus on slavery and white supremacy. I am so grateful to the Mass Historical Society for hosting this extraordinary event and to our many sponsors who have helped us promote it and who are listed on the event website and to you, all of you for being here tonight with us. And now I wish to turn the stage to Catherine Algor the president of the Massachusetts Historical Society. Thank you, Professor Ramirez for that warm welcome. And I want to acknowledge all the work that the team from the Northeastern University School of Law's Criminal Justice Task Force has put in to this series with a particular acknowledgement of the two Barbaras, Barbara Berenson and Barbara Dorch O'Cara, both who have been great partners in planning and organizing this series. We also appreciate all of our partner institutions who have helped us reach such a broad audience. With over a thousand people registered for this program, it is clear that tonight is the product of a group effort. There are many more people who should be thanked and I am so sorry that I don't have time to list them all by name, but I think it's time to delve into some serious history. This panel is the first in a five part series that will host one program a month between now and June. Each program looks at a different aspect of the history of racial injustice in Massachusetts. Information on each program can be found on our website and we'll post a link in the chat. The program this evening will begin by looking at how slavery has been central to creating wealth and generating race-based inequality in Massachusetts. Family fortunes institutional endowments and public budgets in the Commonwealth have all benefited from the spoils of slavery. This panel discussion will pair academic and public historians to explore Massachusetts connections to slavery, the wealth slavery created and the poverty it created. And 
ex to, and examine how the legacies of slavery are reflected in the injustices that haunt Massachusetts today. We're gonna be guided in this conversation by Professor Jared Ross Hardesey, who will moderate the panel. Dr. Hardesey is an Associate Professor of History at Western Washington University and a scholar of colonial America, the Atlantic world and the histories of labor and slavery. He is the author of Unfreedom, Slavery and Dependence in 18th Century Boston and Black Lives, Native Lands, White Worlds, A History of Slavery in New England. His current research project examines the murder of an 18th century Boston slave trader, smuggler and chocolatier and is entitled Mutiny on the Rising Sun, a tragic tale of smuggling, slavery, and chocolate. He is no stranger to the society, having held a New England Regional Fellowship through the MHS, and he's participated in two of our seminars and two of our brown bag presentations. I am happy to welcome Dr. Hardesty back to the MHS and turn the program over to him to introduce the other panelists. Wow, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Al Gore and, and Professor Ramirez for the, for the introductions. Um, thank you to the Northeastern School of Law and the Massachusetts Historical Society uh, for the for hosting us to, uh, this evening. It's this afternoon for me. I'm in Washington, so I might get a little messed up on the time. Um, but but and, and thank you all for attending. Um, I'm watching the numbers creep up here on, and we're now up to nearly 600 people. Uh, here with us uh, this evening. Um, it, it is an absolutely incredible turnout uh, and a kickoff for the Criminal Justice Task Force uh, Forces Confronting Racial Injustice Series. And, and it, it speaks to the desire for this, this knowledge, the desire to, to learn more about uh, Massachusetts and Boston's uh, history of, uh, of, of racial injustice and, and, and the legacies of it. Um, our program this evening is entitled Confronting Racial Injustice, Slavery, Wealth Creation, and Intergenerational Wealth. From the 17th century to the 21st, slavery has been central to creating wealth and generating race-based inequality in Massachusetts. Family fortunes, institutional endowments, and public budgets in the Commonwealth have all benefited from the spoils of slavery, as, as Dr. Al Gore mentioned. Many of these symbols that we associate with Massachusetts as well, cod, timber, chips, factories, were key to feeding, clothing, and provisioning enslaved people toiling on plantations across the Western Hemisphere. These connections to slavery emerged early, beginning in the 1630s, and did not disappear until the abolition of slavery in the Americas in the latter half of the 19th century. Even as Massachusetts became a center of the uh, American abolitionist movement in the early 19th century, its textile mills were reliant upon slave produced cotton from the American South. In short, Massachusetts sat at the center of and benefited from an international system of exploitation. Yet slavery was not just an abstract business in early Massachusetts. Merchants and ship captains happily engaged in the slave trade to Africa and within the Americas, trafficking enslaved people across the hemisphere. White settlers were more than happy to enslave people locally, beginning with the region's indigenous population uh, and continuing in the 18, into the 18th century as the labor of enslaved Africans became central to a variety of industries uh, it, across, across the, the, the colonies and the state. While slavery itself came to an end in Massachusetts following the American Revolution in the latter 18th century, the racial animus behind it lived on in deliberate policies of marginalization, segregation, and mass incarceration. This evening program is a conversation between an academic historian and a public historian, a conversation that explores Massachusetts connections to slavery and the slave trade the wealth and the poverty that slavery created and bequeathed, and how the legacies of slavery are reflected in injustices that haunt Massachusetts to this day. Before introducing our panelists, uh, I would like to remind everyone that there will be a brief Q&A at the end of the program. Uh, please feel free to submit your questions at any time throughout the program and they're, they're come to us uh, to, to be answered later. 
We could not have two more qualified uh, experts joining us this evening. I'm very excited for uh, for our two our two panelists this evening, and they are uh, Elon Cook Lee, who is a public historian, educator, and curator. She's trained hundreds of historic site and museum professionals across the country on interpretation theory, interpreting, interpreting the history and legacy of slavery, and how to incorporate anti-oppression frameworks into museum work through her liberation heritage consulting business. For three years, she taught undergraduate courses that covered race in the institution of slavery, public history, restituting stolen art, repair work, and racial reconciliation uh, at the Rhode Island School of Design, RISD. Currently, Elon is the Director of Interpretation and Education at the, Na the National Trust for Historic Preservation. There, she leads the Sites of Enslavement Working Group and is writing a guide for the interpretation of U.S. racial slavery. Our second panelist this evening is Dr. Nicole Maskell, an assistant professor of history at the University of South Carolina and a specialist uh, in the, in, in a specializes in family slaveholding networks in Anglo-Dutch colonial America. Her current book manuscript, Bound by Bondage, Slavery and the Creation of a Northern Gentry is under contract and forthcoming from Cornell University Press. The, her book compares the ways that slavery shaped culture in the Northeastern of what became the United States by examining the social and kinship networks that intertwined enslavers and those they enslaved. Uh, welcome Elon and Dr. Maskeel to, uh, to the conversation this evening. Thank you. I want to open with a big question, uh, and, and, and from there we can we can move our conversation on. But but my big question to to kick us off this evening is what does it mean to confront that a significant amount of Massachusetts's or New England's wealth derived from slavery? I have to say that when I first started on this journey, I was actually very surprised. Um, I, I I didn't really know, and this was years ago, I didn't really know that New England had anything to do with slavery except for being the kind of promised land, right? The, the place that people would run to and be sheltered from. Obviously now we know that it's much more complicated than that. But I think that one thing that was surprising for me in discovering um, that the names of all the places that were so familiar to me, I lived in the Cambridge and Belmont area for nearly 10 years, that all of these people were all slaveholders. Um, I, when I walked along, um, uh, when I went to Brattle Square or Brattle Street, um, uh, all these places, um, even, you know, along the Charles River, uh, um, you know, that thinking of that place as a place of, of where, where enslaved people were working for these huge merchant um, capitalists in order to create this world um, that was an interconnected world of, of family, but also a place where families were torn apart, um, really shocked me to my core. And some of the most, um, I guess the oldest stories we ever tell in history, the fact that they were woven by on the backs of enslaved people and made possible by, you know, the thought of kind of, you know, the Cotton Mathers, um, the Samuel Sewells, uh, the, you know, all of these major families and names in New England, not being able to do their work had they not have offloaded, right, the grunt labor onto enslaved people. It completely um, changed the way I saw the world around me and also the way I approached um, the history that I thought we knew. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds very familiar to my experience. I, much like Nicole, grew up not really learning anything about slavery in New England. I grew up in, in Maryland, so we're in the mid-Atlantic area. And all I really remember from high school was talking about slavery that happened in the South. And I don't even remember anyone telling me slavery even happened in Maryland, in the middle of my state. Um, so it really wasn't until I got to college that I started to hear a little bit. And then in graduate school, cause I, I wanted to study the history of slavery and I wanted to study my ancestry. And I got, a, um, got into Brown University for grad school and was like, okay, I'm gonna study Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia. And all of a sudden I realized, oh no, 
everything has changed. Everything we're focusing on at, at Brown at that point was actually New England slavery. So I had to learn all about that history that I have no memory at all of anyone really talking about. So for me, learning this history, being confronted by this history means changing the way that we actually see history. Who writes history in the first place? How do we look at primary source documents? How do we read those documents and the ways in which bias goes into the reading of those documents? which then goes into how we write and then storytell and then teach others about, you know, the way our country was first, was first founded. So it's, it's th rethinking history. It's rethinking uh, education and how teachers are trained and what they're teaching their students. It's rethinking how we see the landscape um, around us, you know, the buildings, the street names, the, the monuments and memorials, the, who gets to have a school named after them? All of that stuff. Suddenly, completely different understanding of those things. And at the end of it, being confronted with this history means rethinking myself, rethink, mm -hmm. rethinking who we are as individuals in this country. Because, you know, if you've been here, if your family has been here more than a few generations, you've got some kind of connection to the history of slavery. And maybe not slavery in America, maybe slavery in the Caribbean, maybe slavery in Canada, maybe slavery in India. But we have all of these connections. And suddenly it's like, wait a minute, what does this mean to me as an individual, to the life that I have right now, to where I live, to where I went to school, to how much you know, success my ancestors were able to have in their lives. So it's, it's, all, it's all interconnected. Yeah, this is a really fascinating. There's a lot of points to kind of dig into in, in, in both your answers. But something that struck me in your in, in, in both your answers that you both noted was your shock, your surprise at, at learning about you know New England slavery that existed. I, I, I'm from Ohio. I, I found the same thing. I think it's one of the reasons I, I became so interested in the topic because it felt like something was revealed to me um, when I when I finally dug in a little bit into the primary sources. As you said, Elon. So my, I guess my, my my kind of question is, why why have we forgotten this history? If, if it is, it's in the street names. It's in you know, it's it's literally in front of you. You can't walk in Boston without seeing the legacy of slavery. Why? Maybe the first place to start is why why can't we? Uh, why why don't why have we forgotten that? Why was it forgotten? I guess. I I, I when I think about um, how history is written and the types of questions that were asked, I think that comes to the beginning of why, the his, why, why this history was forgotten. And also um, the uses of history, right? In the 19th century, um, as the, um, the, the sectional divide happened in the United States, stories started to be told about um, the founding of the nation in order to support um, regional identities. All right, um, there's the Pilgrims and the Mayflower in Northeast and the, you know, the dirty Jamestown settlers <laughs> in the South, like these, these origin stories. And of course, the story in New England um, was, um, for lack of a better word, whitewashed on purpose, right? The, 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 um, because they were casting themselves as the land of liberty that had never not only had slavery, but even black people at all, right? or any brown people at all. That it was this white promised land, this city on a hill. And I, I never really thought about how those, you know, even as late as, you know, the turn of the 21st century, those stories were still, um, prevalent, at least in popular understandings, and even still, I think, at, stand at the center of debates of how we tell history. And I, I think about, I think about um, the stories that animate, and, and, and Elon, you said it so well, that animate how we not only learn history, but how it's taught. Um, and that is part of, um, and, and these are old kind of tales. And in it's funny because when I um, first started on this journey of, of early American history, um, I didn't want to be a historian at all. <laughs> I wanted to be in a diplomat, actually. And I took a class on a whim um, taught by Professor Laura Ulrich. Uh, and, 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 and one of the classes, we were, we were basically challenged to write a paper, a 40-page essay on an object. And I um, stumbled upon a tombstone 
across from Har Harvard College in Old Cambridge Bay Ground of a little girl named Cicely. And I was so shocked because at that point I was 19 and she died at 15 and she was black. And it just really struck me. And I'm like, well, I'm at Harvard. There's going to be a million books written about this. This woman died, you know, a long time ago. It's the only, it's the earliest tombstone in this, you know, it's going to be great. So I go to Widener, Widener um, um, Library and there's nothing. And there's nothing on her. And I off, I wondered, I said, well, you know, I can find all this stuff about her enslaver, William Brattle, but nothing on her. And, 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 and her story really animated my life and my, my passion. And I think that, that, that the stories we tell and the people we tell them about, right? This woman has been buried in you know, Old Cambridge burial ground since, you know, the turn of the 18th century and right across from the like seat of learning, right? <laughs> one of the major seats of learning in the world. And we've never really talked about her or know her name, um, mm. but we have name, all the names of her enslavers everywhere. So the, these are telling stories, mm. our subconscious um, about our history um, and, and, and about our society and who we are as a people, who belongs in the we the people and who don't, who does mm. not. <laughs> So I'm, the way I kind of see it is that this is kind of less of an issue of forgetting. Because a lot of times when you forget, it's like, <laughs> oh, I was supposed to pick up turkey at the store, you know, and I, you know, I got distracted and I just forgot. Like it's, it wasn't forgetting. It, it was erasure that mm -hmm. in our history, in our history books, the way we, uh, the way those books were written, like, like I was saying when it, uh, when it comes to bias. A lot of this um, kind of goes back to when I was in college and I was actually studying the history of slavery in Mexico. <laughs> um, and that's another one where people are like, there was slavery in Mexico, what? And I mean, a crazy massive story there. And one of the things that I was finding out was that the history of slavery was actually originally taught in schools in Mexico, in all public schools. And then there was a new secretary of education who suddenly showed up in the mid 1800s and said, nope, no more of this. And all those books went out and new books came in and those new books were written as though black people did not exist in the country. And so you had generations of, of Afro-Mexicans thinking to themselves, they were either descended from Jamaicans who had just showed up like, I don't know, two years ago or that they were descended from like a mystical, dark skinned, curly haired indigenous group. When you erase that history, everyone ends up forgetting at one point or another. And you might have one or two people who can say, oh no, no, that's not true. But if the majority of people, and especially if you're educated generation after generation after generation, to, to see the world, to see the history in a particular way, then that one person who knows the truth is that crazy guy on the corner. Mm -hmm. And so for a lot of our history, that person who knew the truth is just like, no, they don't know what they're talking about because George Washington is a great man because, you know, this person who owned this beautiful house must have been an intelligent, hard worker. And that's how that house was created. That's why that church is so enormous because people worked really hard and they were good people. And that's what happened. And it's like, no, the reality was they actually owned human beings. They bought and sold men, women, and lots of children and for their own profit and used that money to build those really nice houses. So, I mean, it's a lot of times when you're trying to figure out why something happened, you have to think about the question of who does it serve? Like mm -hmm. who gets to have their life and their lifestyle justified by seeing the world in a particular way? And people in power for much of our nation's history, it served them for us to not think about slavery, for us to not think about racial inequity, for us to not think about any of those things that makes a particular group of people really look bad in our nation's history. Hmm. Yeah, so that, that was kind of where I, where I was thinking, you know, there is, it, it strikes me as a very deliberate process. There were, there were decisions made to what history to tell and what what history not to tell, and in, in some ways it, it it starts fairly innocuously, right? That, that it's about a sexual conflict, which wasn't innocuous for 
great to civil war, but but uh, it, 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 you know, it, it, so essentially, it's a, are we are we just repeating 19th century propaganda? But there has been this sort of a tendency, especially among white New Englanders and, and white people in the United States in general, to forget, ignore, and and confine. If it is told, it's generally confined, uh, or it's it's made to be really quaint. What, why? Why is that, Elon? I know you're kind of getting to that in your last day. So why? Why is there this tendency to to just kind of forget it, move on, uh, to confine it to to uh, all, you know we're, we have one site we might talk about it or something like that. So why? Why is there this tendency to to, to forget? I guess. I mean, in the the research that I've done, it's been about setting a particular image of someone. So. When it comes to our nation's schools and textbooks, a lot of the erasure happened when the United Daughters of the Confederacy really started jumping in and um, lobbying for uh, changes in particular school systems when it comes to talking about the history of the Civil War. Um, there was also, um, you know, demanding that certain professors, like if you had a in some cases, you had like a New England college professor move down to like a Virginia college or something and is teaching the history of slavery, talking about race and African Americans and indigenous people. And the UDC, the United Daughters of Confederacy, would, because they had a certain amount of political and social power as people outside of politics in one way or another, um, were able to put pressure on the schools to either um, remove that professor or strongly encourage them to change the way they were teaching. Mm -hmm. um, in a lot of the things that I've been doing more recently when it comes to historic sites, the history of preservation in this country, our very first preserved historic house was George Washington's Mount Vernon. And that was started by the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. The Mount Vernon Ladies Association was made up predominantly by slave owners, female mm -hmm. slave owners and was also funded by a lot of slave owners and several key people in the Confederacy. So they were really pushing to kind of recreate George Washington as a particular type of person who did good deeds, who was strong, who was determined, who was strategic, and anything that could be seen as negative that he did was kind of explained away or just you know, shoved off in a back corner somewhere as a thing we'll talk about later, moving on to the next thing. And so it's, it's, it's sometimes it's that redirection of attention of, you know, we told you the information, but actually this other thing is much more important. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's, it's putting a lot of emphasis on, on one part of the history over another, but a lot of it is just the way that we story tell about different individuals from histories and different parts of history because we want our kids to look up to those people mm. and our kids shouldn't look up to people who were violent or who were okay with violence happening in their name mm. we want our kids to look up to people who were nice and did nice mm. things and you know just founded a country and it's fine <laughs> everything's fine yeah yeah, yeah that's um and, and nicole you i know you've done you've done a lot of the research on this um and so because you know it is it is deliberate because the evidence is there. So what sort of evidence is out there that, that someone could just go and kind of find, say, evidence of the connections of slavery to the, the ownership of enslaved people? What, what what's out what's out there? Well, there really has been a renaissance in access um, that's happening now in terms of opening up the archives. And of course, um, the Mass Historical um, Society is a part of this renaissance, opening up uh, access. You can find um, all sorts of information if you were interested in looking, um, account books, ledgers, but also diaries, things that are published, like the diary of Samuel Sewell. Um, you have um, Harvard's library. Um, archives are also open. And in these documents, a lot of times these documents have been read in a certain way for years. And so you might see them quoted or referenced. But then when you read the entire, you know, the entire diary entry or the entire ledger people are talking about, where you read about a specific place in Boston, you'll see in the original documents, they list all the enslaved people who have worked there. They'll list their names, the types of things they did, sometimes the ways that they died. Um, they'll talk about a time that's not so distant from our own. 
of contagion and of epidemic and how um, this epi these epidemics, if you know where to look, look at the newspapers of the time period, um, which is also um, many of them are becoming more accessible. You find stories of, 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 of enslaved workers um, who were you know, put in harm's way and died in higher proportions uh, to their population numbers. It's a story that is important to understand because of the roots of, of what we're going through now, of course, are our old roots and their and mm -hmm. things um, like it. But I think a lot of times people in the past thought you had to go to a place like Widener or to a, you know, a library and sit down. And for a long time you did, but now um, there's so many resources online that you can just, if you're interested, you know, in, in, in the history of, um, of slavery in New England, you can access so many resources. And some of them, if you're not interested in reading through a whole bunch of ledgers, like me, <laughs> <laughs> um, you can go out your, your front door if you, if you live in the area. And I know this is something Elon talks about a lot, kind of this public history, and you can find, do like I did, you know, stumble upon a tombstone that sat around for hundreds of years, or, you know, take a stroll down Tory Lane, <laughs> you know, the Longfellow house, check out the Cambridge uh, um, Adult Education Building, which was a brattle house where enslaved people lived. Uh, one woman um, was 100 years old. She spent a century enslaved to the brattles right there in that house. So all of these things, the history, um, and now, of course, with the um, with the, the things that we are able to uh, get on the internet, you can kind of overlay these places with the stories of the past, some of the stories are are horrific, uh, like the story of Phyllis that you um, talk about in your book, uh, Jared, and how you know she was burned at the stake, um, right on Linnean Street, right, right, right down the street from Harvard, so the smoke could be seen from the yard. These different things, and, and you know, boss, you know, all of these stories, um, which used to be hidden behind closed doors in the archives, which of course is a part of the conversation as well. You know how how access to these stories makes these types of histories come out more. Mm -hmm. um, but as a, as a, as a historian, I, I think about how access and democratizing the archives and democratizing access is so central to, um, to making these stories come alive um, that were hidden in plain sight, um, but, but are being rediscovered um, mm -hmm. largely in light of the things that are happening today, right? The people mm -hmm. who are being brutalized because of the legacies and continued um, uh, the, the continued the continued legacies of this 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 history of oppression and um, and racialized violence. Yeah, that's that's a really because it kind of leaves the the, the next uh, question I want to ask is there's just kind of historical amnesia. It, it, it's deliberate despite the, this preponderance of evidence that's there, as, as you described, Nicole, and and so. How has this process of forgetting that this kind of historical amnesia uh, contributed to and perpetuated racial inequality? So it's not just that you know that, that we've kind of forgotten this history, but it but does it have a connection to kind of the, the legacies of uh, in the and to con contemporary racial injustice? Yeah, I mean, when you frame the conversations about things like reparations as you know, I'm going to say this in the bluntest way, lazy people who are just having a handout for free money, um, when you don't realize that the entire conversation started in the 17th and 18th centuries with enslavers who were trying to argue for reparation for the loss, and they received, by the way, reparation, monetary reparation for the loss of their enslaved people, which they then used to reinvest into slaving voyages, into endowing chairs at Yale and Harvard, the wonderful work um, done by Craig Wilder, um, looking at mm -hmm. the roots of the, um, the, the higher education system, you realize that the way that we frame the people who, who say these things uh, are all about race, right? Um, black and brown people who ask for reparations are lazy. And these are the same types of language. If you look at the old documents um, that, that they use to describe people of color, to describe why it's okay to discriminate, why it was okay to enslave, lazy and slow, all of these things that we, the language we use today are inheritances from 
the past, a very much direct inheritance from the past. Uh, and I do think it has, you know, when we talk about generational wealth, I'm interested in the history of families and these very wealthy families. That's persist some of these are the wealthiest families to this day. Um, and they got that wealth from centuries of investment income um, derived off the bodies and, 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 and the broken families of enslaved people. My own family has been in the United States since 1619, we've recently discovered. And, um, you know, in 400 years, because our side of the family um, was not, you know, we were related to the, the, the enslavers, but, you know, we were Black, um, you know, we had not received, and this isn't a discussion of, you know, I need money from an enslavement that happened centuries ago, but rather the continued um, injustice of, of the foundation of our monetary and social systems in this country. And that it, its foundation, sadly enough, is enslavement um, and it is bondage. Um, the, the, uh, the unfree, as you put in your book, um, mm -hmm. labor of so many hundreds and of thousands, millions of people uh, forgotten, but obviously um, still being exploited um, and still making money for the institutions that enslave them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I am completely echoing everything <laughs> Nicole just said. Um, I mean, I, I, I feel like sometimes this question is, is kind of about like, what's the purpose of history? And for, I think for a long time, the purpose of history is to make Americans feel really good about America. But I think the purpose of history should really be to make the present make sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is really why I got into history in the first place in, in undergrad. I was, I was trying to understand, okay, why do people act differently around me? I, I feel like people are acting differently around me because of my hair, because of my skin, because of my lips, because of my gender, because of my body. And I was trying to understand that, but also not just my body, but my parents' bodies, my siblings' bodies, my relatives' bodies, my friends' bodies. Why, what's happening? What is this thing that's happening to us? I don't understand. And because I wasn't getting that context in my, my history classes and any of my other classes in, in, um, in school, at least until I got to, to undergrad, it was completely perplexing. Why do I live here? Why do I go to this school? Why, what happened to segregation? Why was that necessary? Like, why did, why did Martin Luther King become famous? Like, what, why was he important and why was he necessary? If you don't understand that lynchings were happening, that, that segregation was a bad thing. If you don't understand that racial discrimination meant that some people could get certain jobs and other people couldn't. If you don't understand any of that, then the big movements in America don't make sense. Um, a few years ago, I was working with the, the Robbins House, which is an African-American historic site in Concord, Massachusetts. And we were doing a program on the 4th of July and we're trying to contextualize for people the, the you know, the, the history of the 4th of July, uh, the reasons for writing the Declaration of Independence. And I started realizing for, you know, I had just read the Declaration of Independence for the first time in as part of that job and realizing there were direct parallels between the demands of the Declaration and the demands of the March on Washington. Mm. and the demands of the Black Lives Matter movement. And it was just like, whoa, mm. hold on, wait a minute. And so we, as part of our 4th of July program every year, we put all of those things into conversation with each other. And suddenly members of the public who came to us and were saying, I don't understand Black Lives Matter movement. What are Black people so angry about? Why are they burning things? Why are they protesting in the streets? What's going on? All of a sudden they were like, oh, wait, so that's connected to slavery. Oh, so that's in, an inequality happens. Oh, and racial segregation. 
oh, where's my Black Lives Matter t-shirt? It was like all of a sudden people were, they were suddenly getting it. And, and for so much, for so many of us, you know, born and raised in America, going through American school system, we, we get these big moments in history, but they're not contextualized in a way so that we can understand what's going on now in our lives, how all of that connects, why it impacts us. And so once you start helping people build a full picture, a full picture of the history, then all of a sudden their lives make so much more sense. And a lot of them change their behavior and vote differently. Mm. Mm. But, you know, they they need that opportunity for learning to really make those kinds of those mm-hmm. kinds of changes. Yeah. It's yeah, it's it's excellent. Um so I want to switch gears just a little bit and then kind of dig in a little bit deeper. Um because I, I one of the things that, that comes to mind, because you, you mentioned George Washington a lot, and I'm thinking about it. Nicole, you're in South Carolina. I think about there's Americans' this tendency. We're talking about northern propaganda and, and this, you know, downplay, this deliberate downplaying slavery. And so, one of the things that keeps coming up to mind is that there is this kind of comparison, even if it's not right. There's always this comparison, right, to so slavery, New England, to slavery in the South. And so, I kind of wanted to to ask, you know, because in some ways, slavery in New England and Massachusetts is much more abstract. Right. There are enslaved people here and, and, and this number of families own quite a few, like the royal family, the Brattle family. Um, but for a lot of uh, folks, slavery is much more of an abstraction. Right. They, they, they provision plantations. They, they buy slave produced cotton. And so they're, they're in some ways one step removed. How does that kind of affect the way in which we remember slavery, the way in which we, we talk about the legacies of slavery? Uh, how, does, how does that work and how does that kind of change the conversation a bit? And, and especially as we're thinking about the, the legacies of, of racial injustice. For so many years, I, um, at least um, in the field of history, the question of numbers was always kind of, uh, you know, forefront. Well, how many numbers, how many people were actually enslaved in Boston, in you know Rhode Island, in um, you know in these north northeastern places, and then we can situate it within this larger, you know, southern facing enslaved world. Um, uh, and you know, it's interesting to in my own research, I've discovered that they're all the same people. Like, for example, um, John Vassell, who was an enslaver in Barbados, um, he um, gets um, this, he's given um, authority by the Lord's proprietors to um, build a colony of, of Charleston, and he does, or Charlestown, and he does in North Carolina, that goes belly up because his um his, um, his uh, the, another person who was his competition, Sir John Yeamans, successfully um, builds a colony of Charleston in South Carolina. So instead of kind of um, licking his wounds, uh, he enslaves several um, native uh, uh, people and um, brings up enslaved people from uh, from South Carolina to, um, you, you guessed it, Cambridge, Massachusetts. His family um, uh, um, settles right along Tory Row. So the actual, um, the mobility of this of this world is something that really jumped out at me as as well and the fact that it was a world of waterways it was a world that was was much more mobile than we think of and so i think that this question of numbers right and also the abstraction of of new england uh, enslavement you, know, you don't have people picking cotton of course everyone thinks of cotton right <laughs> picking cotton you know in harvard yard like you don't have that those aren't those visceral you know ideas, but you do have people, you know, serving tea um, and meetings of, of, um, uh, of, of, the, of the Harvard Corporation in people's homes or in, um, you know, um, people who are, you know, uh, taking away waste. I, I was shocked to hear that, you know, of course, there weren't, um, there weren't sewage systems. Uh, like we have now, no flushing toilets, but of course, these cities like Boston, um, uh, uh, Philadelphia, New York, they had armies of enslaved people basically taking waste away and what that would meant to be that close to kind of these types of materials uh, for your health and for different things. It's a different type of slavery and the question of brutality, uh, um, um, kind of comparative brutality is something that I think is, is a little bit of a red herring. It's a way of moving the very presentness of enslavement and, and people's stolen lives, you know, 
and abstracting it to elsewhere, um, especially being somewhere when I'm, I'm in South Carolina now. And when we talk about this, we're like, oh, there was slavery in the North. And there's kind of this, still this um, kind of um, sectional um, belief <laughs> that, well, this kind of absolves, you know, absolves my section of the guilt mm -hmm. to a certain extent of enslavement. And I think that if you're getting to those questions, you're asking the wrong question, right? You're, you're, you're asking the wrong, this was part of a, a system and, and without, you know, New England, Boston, uh, the system would not have worked, right? It would have collapsed. They were the, the you know, they were a key and integral part of the system. Um, and some of these people were, as I said, the exact same people because of the mobility of the time. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that that answers your question, but I, yeah. I, I always think it's, it's so interesting because it's always been this kind of question of numbers, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Who was, yeah. what slavery was less, more kind and less kind? And you're just like, mm -hmm. we're talking about degrees of kindness for bondage. Right? Yeah, yeah. Thing. Yeah, it's always the numbers game and it's you know it, it's a way of dismissing new england slavery actually oh only four percent of the population was enslaved at the time of revolution it doesn't matter well it, it does actually quite a bit <laughs> as, as you just said so elon did you want to weigh in on that yeah so um in my work and in the work of interpretation at historic sites one of the things that we're trained is people remember stories you remember humanizing stories nobody remembers numbers i mean unless you're like a mathematician or something like that some people are really math minded and they remember the numbers and that's great but the vast majority of people they don't remember you know thousands or millions or five people unless it's somehow connected and wrapped around the story and so a lot of times when we're talking about the history of slavery it's the it's the the millions gone. It's the four hundred. It's the thousand. It's it's those numbers, and so a lot of the work that I do, especially when um, I used to do a walking tour in in Providence, Rhode Island, and you know people would always say, oh, but there wasn't really slavery in New England, and you know there were probably only like five people who were enslaved in Providence. So like, how are you going to have a whole ninety minute two hour tour? That's it's too much. And it's like, okay, well, first we have to talk about the slave owners. We have to talk about the slave traders. We have to talk about where they live. Yeah, sure, they only had one or two people, but those are people, those are interesting people. And there's information about them. We have one guy who was a, a sailor and we know all about his life. We have generations of his descendants that have been documented. You know, we, we, there's another guy who we know basically built half of Providence, physically lifted and moved. And then by the time Brown University came along, he was the one who was actually managing, he was, he was a supervisor of the building of Brown's first building on its, on its current campus. I mean, these are interesting people when you take the time to pull their information from the, the primary sources, pull it together into a story and then tell people the story. Otherwise, it's three enslaved people worked on University Hall at Brown. Like, it, it's so, so key to have the, those stories there. Otherwise, it's something that can be just trivial. It's a fact that you memorize in time for a test, and then you move on and you never remember that information again. So I, I, I can't emphasize enough the, the importance of storytelling. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so it's kind of our last question. I, I want to, uh, you know, give uh, acknowledgement to our host, the, uh, the Criminal Justice Task Force, and kind of ask, you know, all of these issues of wealth inequality, the, the place of slavery in, in Massachusetts history and, and for wealth generation and intergenerational wealth and the creation of poverty, racial injustice. Um, how, how does it, uh, how should it, uh, how the, these conversations about slavery inform our current conversations about criminal justice reform. I mean, I'll, I'll say that a lot of it is making sure that, you know, our officers are better, better educated from the very beginning. I argue from kindergarten, not necessarily from training <laughs> school, um, but the more information people have, the more that does help to break down some of the stereotypes that are in people's minds. Um, there's always the issue of institutional racism and inequality. 
and the fact that even if you're not going to educate people more, um, you know, the, uh, the actual law enforcement officers, then you have to make sure that you're building policies into place that take into uh, account the history, not just the history of policing, but the history of the community, the people who live in the community, the various immigrant groups who have come over the hundreds of years of whenever. It's important to have all of that information at hand when building or in a lot of cases rebuilding the policies that are in place. I mean, if, if, if you don't have that history there, then you're just going to keep going with a lot of the same stuff, or you won't even know that you've had problems and be able to see that. Um, I, I have to agree with that. And I, and, I, and I wanted to take on this one point that you made in your last comment about the stories that we tell. Um, so much of, at least when I was living in Boston, so much of the stories of the spaces like you talk about are not stories that are linked to enslavement. You go to, you know, the Boston Common, right? <laughs> and, you know, you're walking along um, beautiful, you know, gardens and you seek Park Street Church and you're not thinking about enslaved people getting executed on the common or burned at the stake. But if we did think about it, if these were the first things we thought about, just like we think about the Salem witch trials, right? This is, has the power to change the way that people think about um, justice and, and the roots of justice. So it's a, it's, it becomes a knee jerk, like, okay, is this, a, you know, people still say, is this a witch hunt? And of course they are evoking the witch trials in New England. But of course we have a much longer and richer history, um, horrific history of, you know, um, of, of surveillance, community surveillance, um, of brutalities um, against black and brown people. And this is the history that once, like you said, once we tell the stories, once these stories have names, um, we'll have the ability hundreds of years to now to be in the marrow of our bones, the same way these other stories that are being told are in the marrow of the bones and, and have the power to transform society um, um, on a visceral level. Um, and I hope that I'm part of, I'm excited to be part <laughs> of changing the narrative um, of this time period and of these places and of these people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, and thank you uh, both. Um, before we go to the Q&A, your last comment about stories, and, and it reminded me when I was uh, going through the town, colonial town records in, in Boston in the 18th century, uh, there is the, there's a night watch created in the 1760s. Um, there's some concerns about theft and fires. Um, and so the town creates a, a night watch and almost immediately uh, about 30 percent of the people they're they're interrogating it you see in their reports are, are of african descent and, and, i mean it, it's 10 percent of the town's population and it's just disproportionate from the moment any sort of police force is created it is disproportionately uh, aimed at uh, people of color i uh, just uh, same thing if you look at warning out records it, it, the, the moment there's any sort of community placing it it disproportionately affects people of color uh, it, it was, that was just really striking to to see in the records um, yeah, so we're going to take a few questions from the audience. There's quite a few popping up. Um, and so one of our, our uh, attendees asked, uh, can you talk about the connection between historical slavery uh, and the current ways in which the, the holding of wealth or, or lack of holding of wealth in certain communities is affected, uh, is, is, is affected today? So is it, you know, can we see the direct connection between slavery even, and this is an interesting part of the question, it's even among people who might not have been in North America at the time, so immigrants who say came after the, the end of slavery. Um, I, can, I, can, I can kind of try to tackle this question. Um, as somebody who lived in, in Belmont and Cambridge and you know, some of these very high rent neighborhoods, mm -hmm. many of these neighborhoods have always been high rent, and they are that way because of their connection to these slave traders and to these slaving families. Take Harvard Square, for example, um, that, that, that kind of stretch that has all those beautiful homes, Longfellow House, um, um, the, 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 the Brattle House, all of these beautiful homes. Um, so some of the most 
expensive places to live in New England um, uh, are places where enslavers lived. And then they became places of segregation later on because as, as, la as laws are passed of who can be in these places and these laws are passed and they are basically expelling black people um, from these neighborhoods. And you see this systematically throughout New England. So even if your ancestor came you know, later on in the 19th century, and you're moving into these neighborhoods, many of these spaces are cleared spaces, spaces that are cleared of, uh, of, of black and brown people who were living in these areas um, uh, by law in order to create a space, uh, an imagined community um, that was white. And so in that way, these places that were connected to kind of lived experience of slavery, even today that are very kind of out of reach for people of African descent. Um, also, and I think you were talking about being in the spaces today as a black person, there is surveillance. Like you're not supposed to be here, right? <laughs> you're not supposed, what are you doing here? You know, being followed around um, and thrown out of stores <laughs> while, you know, while researching. These are things that are vestiges of these spaces connection to um, to enslavement and to and 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 then later on to segregation, um, but I think Elon is really the expert in this. I <laughs> defer to her in talking about you know, these types of things. I mean, I guess uh, when I get this question, I, I usually think of you know the as an example, Nicole, you were just talking about the different spaces, the communities, the neighborhoods. So in in Providence, Rhode Island, so that's where I lived for eight years until recently. Um, looking at the housing segregation maps. So after the end of, after slavery ends in Rhode Island at the end of the 1700s, the, um, basically all of the black community, the formerly enslaved people are, are being sequestered into a handful of very small little neighborhoods that are around the big wealthy neighborhood of College Hill where like Brown University and Risky are. And so during this period, slavery is over, but we've got serious housing segregation because enslaved um, black people, other than a handful of one or two here and there, are basically not allowed to live on the hill. Not only are they not allowed, even if they really could, they can, most of them cannot afford it, even if they want to. And the only ones who can afford it are also have some kind of special permission from a former owner or a former owner family to live on a portion of their property. And that's it, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you, you go on another decade or so, you've got larger increasing waves of, of uh, immigrants coming from different parts of Europe. So a lot of Portuguese coming in, especially. They initially move into those black communities because those are the only places they're allowed to go because they're immigrants. They're not really white yet. And then within a couple more generations, that community starts spreading out and you start seeing uh, the Portuguese. You start seeing, uh, there, there's like handfuls of like other smaller immigrant groups. There's Irish groups uh, who are then like moving out to other communities and creating other little settlements. And so once you hit the 1950s and 60s, you can see in the housing segregation maps, those redlining maps, you can actually see the former black community that used to be a lot more racially mixed is now just black people or like just um, uh, black and African uh, and indigenous, uh, indigenous folks. And then you can see the Portuguese folks who used to live in there, you can see they've moved here, they've moved over there. So as people get folded into you know, um, one American racial category or another, then where they get to live change, the kinds of jobs they can have changes. So, I mean, you cannot separate race in America from slavery in America. It's, it, it's not possible. They, they were formed together here in this country. So whether you showed up on the Mayflower or you came in the 1800s, you showed up off a plane somehow in the middle of the pandemic yesterday, you are still going to be seriously impacted by American racial ideologies. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it doesn't matter who you think you are. It really matters what Americans think you are or what people in power in America think you are. So, I mean, I, we had a, a conversation um, 
with a um, an Indian American, a man from India, um, who had immigrated to Rhode Island and was seeing himself in a lot of ways like a white American, but he was darker skin. We were almost the same complexion. And so when he had a baseball cap on and casual clothing, he was treated like a black person and he couldn't understand it. And he was really offended by it. He was like, why are people treating me this way? It's like, because they think you're black. Mm. It doesn't matter who you think you are. It doesn't matter that you're actually not a black American. It just matters how people in power see you. And that's how you're going to be treated. And if you don't like that, you can join up with all the other people who don't like it. And then we can collectively change that. But yeah, I, I, I get that. I've gotten that question many, many times. It's like, but my ancestors just got here. And it's like, and that's wonderful for them. But as soon as they are here, they have to deal with our uh, American racial ideologies. Mm-hmm. And that's unfortunate, but that's how it is, unfortunately. So. Yeah, de- definitely. That was, that was really great um, way to explain it. Um, so we have an interesting question here because we mentioned this idea of compartmentalizing the history. It's not always been completely ignored, but it has been part compartmentalized. And one of the ways it's been compartmentalized is by upholding famous Black individuals. So Crispus Attucks, Prince Hall. Uh, these. And so how does this play a role in kind of deflecting attention, kind of downplaying the the larger place and role of slavery in the generation of inequality? Uh, um, When I was a student, um, I um, was introduced after finding this tombstone. I want to know more about this Black community. I was like, what? What is this? Who would she have known? Who would she have? Who would Cecily have been involved in and of course everyone talks about Phyllis Wheatley who by the way was an amazing person and she was an enslaved um, little girl who was named after the slave ship that was brought in on and you know the Wheatley family purchased her and continued to keep, keep her as a laborer even as she's writing all these incredible poems but so much when I was going to school the discussion was about these you know exemplary black people Du Bois behind me New Englanders who were just above and beyond, you know, and that is also, of course, part of this narrative that about of Black people who have to, you know, achieve and achieve and achieve in order to be seen as equal. But I think this also, there's also a more nefarious, you know, issue, uh, part of this, this imagining of these Black people, these exemplary Black, Black people somehow living in these communities as exemplars, and the other Black people either not being in the community or all being, you know, all having negative associations uh, given to them. For example, Phyllis Wheatley, up until recently, um, this great work done um, by Vincent Coretta to kind of bring her husband's life back into three you know, dimensions was seen as being married to this kind of guy who was this this you know layabout who was the reason that she died in poverty this black man who was improvident who didn't who couldn't keep a job right and 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 so her, the entire community these exemplars are sometimes held up as exceptions to of course the rule mm-hmm. of the criminal um and in some ways um um, um, uh, d- you know, th- this this criminal element, <laughs> this, mm-hmm. as, as Samuel Seymour wrote, uh, wrote, this extra vested blood who cannot be part of the, of the body politic. Mm-hmm. And so I try to kind of, I like, I'm interested in the quote unquote ordinary individuals and what they did on a day-to-day basis, because it really normalizes, I think, the place of of Black people of all backgrounds, of all abilities, of all interests. I like to talk about the musicians who were walking around the town and, and, and stopping in and, you know, teaching teaching the flute or teaching the violin. And these ordinary people to normalize that these were people whose lives were lived just like ours. Right? They had children, they had families, they cared about, they had pe- loved ones, they had passions, they had vices. They were human beings and not this kind of, we're going to talk about these people. When I was a child, you know, people like um, Martin Luther King, he would pop out of history to be kind of the savior character. And then, you know, we move on to the different eras. Like each era has them, you know, you know the Thomas, uh, the, the, um, the, the, um, 
Frederick Douglasses, the Martin Luther Kings, all of these exemplar Black people who are the exceptions to the rule of criminality. Um, I think part of telling these stories of ordinary people, um, people who aren't wealthy or in some way favored by society, uh, makes them normalized human beings, fully realized um, people. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I, I agree. And I, I just want to add that um, a lot of times when we focus in on like the special Black people, we kind of put them on a pedestal and they're shaved of any imperfections, any, you know, anything that makes them not like a very idealized human. Like, you know, like, just like you were said with Martin Luther King, like he was like a perfect creature that none of us could ever want to be. Like we could never be him, right? I mean, that's often how we're, we're taught about, about these individuals. And I think it's, it's letting everyone be fully hu realized human beings makes them more relatable and, you know, encourages especially young people, especially kids, to realize that they too can lead a revolution. Um, you know, they too can make serious changes. They too can do something interesting with their lives. So, I mean, I, I think that um, having some interesting great black people is always awesome. I know it's Black History Month and that's what we do. We talk about the great blacks. Um, but it's, it's also always key to talk about, just like with the cool thing, all the the normal people who did really important, really useful work, and I mean that's why I, I love the work of of doing walking tours in the community because you can find out more about average citizens who often impacted your life in a more direct way than I don't know George Washington maybe did. So I mean I guess he helped find the country, whatever. But it's always really useful to get those 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 smaller stories that people who are relatable to you and to be able to see yourself in history in that way. So I, I think it's less. In, and so, oh, and a last point, a lot of times when we do the, the great blacks, like Nicole was saying, it's in it's in contrast to the the majority of black people that where there's something wrong with them. They live in poverty. They're in jail. They are on drugs. I mean, I had someone from another country come up to me and ask me that question. Like, why are all black people in jail and on drugs except for Martin Luther King? And it's like, what kind of question is that? Um, and, and so, you know, when you have the majority of black people criminalized and, the, and a very tiny, you know, a talented tenth, let's say, that's held up as you know, um, someone who's worthy of honor and that's it, then it, it makes an average person feel, feel bad about themselves. It, it, it feels like, well, I must be assorted with the criminals. I want to be, and, and it must be practically impossible to be one of the greats because they are so perfect. Wow, great. Those are great answers. Um, I've already one more question, um, and then and then we'll let you on with, <laughs> with your lives. Um, uh, so, uh, so what I said, um, do you think the rise of social media has helped or hurt the spread of, of inac inaccuracies about uh, about this history of slavery, about the the, the origins of racial inequality and, and wealth inequality and things like that? Is is the I mean this is this is big in the news. Everyone's talking about you know its impact on elections and, and all that. Uh, what about on how we understand the past and this particular past? I think that the rise of social media has been um, ha has been can okay. I think it's a powerful uh, tool for, to to getting information out and to creating networks and of course networks are something that I'm interested in in the early in the early period but also in our own period about sharing certainly among um, historians and getting kind of our sometimes we can be very much in our closets in our rooms doing our work but getting that work out to people who are really interested in it that people aren't not knowing this stuff because they're like I don't want to know but just because they don't know so I think in that way it has been a force for good um, and an increased 
um, knowledge in society. But I do think that there is a danger. I've seen, of course, even in my own family network of people getting bad uh, bad information. Um, and it's so easy to twist um, narratives. Uh, that is, of course, the danger. Twist narratives, twist, twist, um, twist stories to fit your own narrative. Um, and I, I see a lot of that happening now. And, and we do see the stakes, right? The stakes couldn't be any higher than they, they couldn't possibly be any higher. Getting this, getting the most accurate information out is so crucial because, um, and I had seen this, you know, as a, as a, as a professor down um, in, you know, in, 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 in communities that are, are, are wrestling over kind of whether or not to implement standards in schools, it becomes a cultural fight, right? You start to say this type of history is the type of history I am associated with because of my political background. And I like to tell people, I don't go into the, the archives wanting to find lots and lots of stories about how Black people were treated and mar treated terribly and marginalized. I am an American just like everyone else. I grew up with the USA, USA in the time period. Right? We all grew up with that. And as, even as, as a Black woman, I still want to see, I want to see the people in the past doing good things because of course that is also our shared history our country but unfortunately that is not the true story and and being able to face the true story and and recognizing your own connection to the narratives of triumphalism um is something that i think everyone has to face in the society and we all have to guard against of uh, inaccuracies um, um and, and the power of persuasion on the one on, on social media can become overpowering. So just keeping that in mind and maybe placing some things in place to keep accuracy up <laughs> and keep inaccuracy down is I think gonna be the challenge for the 21st century. And I'm interested mm -hmm. to see the next generation and us as well tackle that challenge of, of information equality and accuracy. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, the only thing I would add is that there is just social media in some ways helps balance power between the citizen and and journalists and um, and our big, especially our big media outlets. And so if you have if you understand how to see through a lot of the propaganda and misinformation that is out there, then there is a lot of really just outstanding work being done by people in social media. Um, as an example, uh, earlier today, I saw a TikTok about a woman who is a professional nail stylist, and she was creating gel nails while telling the history of Mardi Gras. And it was like legit fact check history and she was doing it while painting nails. And her whole thing is painting her nails on camera. And recently she decided she was also going to talk about history, like legit history. And it was just outstanding. So, I mean, I think in a lot of ways, social media is a great way of meeting people where they are because she had built a massive following of people who just wanted to watch her talk about how she designs really cool nails. And now she's that people are going and they're learning about that and they're learning really interesting histories. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, there's other folks who go into the archives and they, you know, snap photos of primary source documents and then share that on Twitter and on Instagram and they talk about their finds. So it's like, you know, people started off doing like a haul video on, on YouTube and talking about all the stuff they bought at, you know, the local H and M or whatever. And now they're doing archive halls. Like, let me tell you about all the documents I found while I was at the local library. I mean, I think there is just so much great stuff that can be found on social media. And it's such an amazing way to share information. Mm -hmm. It can also be a place for misinformation. But I mean, I think as long as, as there's like a balance there and people are being, are continuously being taught and encouraged to see through the misinformation, then it is, it's an excellent tool for education. Excellent. Well, um, thank you both, uh, Dr. Maschio, Elon. This was, this was a wonderful program, uh, enlightening, um, and I really appreciate it. 
as hard as it is to uh, to, to clap, but uh, it's a, a, a applaud uh, for for the for the panel, and thank you all for attending. Thank you. I think we've got the program off to a great start. Thank you so much, and we'll see you at the next one. Bye-bye. <laughs>